This video on the general topic of cellular control is specifically on protein synthesis, uh, going through the transcription and translation. So let's start with uh, the whole pattern of things. We have information coded on for on DNA and that controls the amino acid sequence of polypeptide chains and uh, because of that the polypeptide chain will fold in a particular way uh, because the sequence of R groups will have been determined in a particular way and therefore the sequence leads to the shape of the protein and that gives its function. The DNA not only codes for the protein itself but it also is involved in controlling when a protein is synthesized. So you have regulator genes which will control when particular proteins are synthesized. Three stages involved in this information transfer. Number one, transcription. That is taking DNA, reading it, and making an mRNA copy of it. The second stage only occurs in eukaryotes. It is modification, and we'll have a little look at that after transcription. And then on to translation, common both to prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and that is reading mRNA and using that to determine the sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide. Transcription. We use the template strand of DNA to synthesize mRNA. So looking at this uh, diagram here, the template strand in this case would be this strand here. This counts as the template strand uh, and this mRNA being made here uh, is being made pairing up to uh, or is being made complementary to the template strand. Ignore the fact that it says coding strand there. It's an older image and I'll give you uh, your OCR approved image in just a little bit. How do we do that? Well we've got RNA polymerase enzyme here and if you zoom out a little bit to this image, RNA polymerase has bounded onto this start signal here. Um, we switch the gene on or the promoter's been on uh, and it's bound on and it's read along the DNA in this direction, uh, along this template strand here, in this direction. And as it's gone along, uh, it has allowed RNA nucleotides to come in and bind, through complementary base pairing, onto the exposed bases of DNA on this template strand here. What it then does is it forms the phosphodiester bonds between the RNA nucleotides. Now what are these RNA nucleotides? This simply is CTP, that's ATP, that's UTP and GTP. This is your OCR approved image uh, because it has this as being the coding strand and this as being the template strand of DNA. So you can see that the uh, bases of mRNA are base pairing up with the template strand of DNA there. This coding strand of DNA, well you can see that it will carry the same code as the mRNA. So we've got C, 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 A, A, G, G, etc, etc, up to T and of course thymine in DNA is replaced by uracil on RNA. Okay, this image shows mRNA then directly leaving the nucleus via the nuclear pore. That is not true. There is another little stage involved before we get to that. So, before we get onto that, which is modification, let's uh, summarize the stages of transcription. We can name our enzyme. It is DNA dependent RNA polymerase, that is, it reads DNA and it makes RNA. It binds to the start sequence on the DNA strand on the template strand. Hydrogen bonds break, uh, holding the two DNA strands together, that double helix unwinds, and mRNA nucleotides now form hydrogen bonds to the template strand nucleotides by complementary base pairing. 
then RNA nucleotides. Well, these RNA nucleotides are triphosphates, ATP, GTP, UTP, and CTP, as we discussed. Um, and the point about them being triphosphates is that that is going to be our energy source for making the phosphodiester bonds. That requires energy. And that forms the sugar phosphate backbone of mRNA. Our ATP, uh, as it uh, gets involved in the polymer, our triphosphate nucleotide, uh, two of those phosphate groups will be lost, um, and that gives us our energy. And that gives us our single strand of mRNA. And as we've discussed, it's got the same sequence as the coding strand, except for U replacing T. Modification. Now, uh, this is a step that doesn't occur in prokaryotes, but it does occur in eukaryotes, uh, and it's extremely important. Uh, indeed, uh, evidence more and more suggests that this does happen in prokaryotes, and that introns do exist in prokaryotes. But, for the time being, uh, let's just think about them in eukaryotes. Well, introns, as we discussed in DNA fingerprinting, are regions of nonsense code within a gene. They space out the exons, and it's the exons which carry the code. Both introns and exons are transcribed to RNA, and then the introns are removed from the RNA by a process called splicing. And once those introns have been spliced out, we then define the RNA as being mRNA, and it's allowed to exit the nuclear pore. It's not allowed to leave until splicing has occurred. These are, I think, helpful images. Um, so, this is a structural gene here. Structural gene is a gene which codes for a protein. And there's an intron and an exon, and da -da 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 -dum. Uh, and we have RNA with exon, intron, exon, intron, exon. And those introns are spliced out, and then it's allowed to leave, uh, and then we consider it to be mRNA. Uh, next stage is going to be translation, reading the mRNA and making a protein from it. This here is also a helpful little image. Uh, and this here in prokaryotes, um, should be okay probably, shows uh, what is thought to happen there. But as I say, increasingly evidence suggests that there are introns in prokaryotes just as there are in eukaryotes, or maybe then less common. The genetic code. So we have mRNA. That has left the nucleus, and it's going to go to the ribosome. How will the ribosome know which amino acids to put in which place? How will it read that? Well, it needs to know how to read the code for a start. And the code itself is a triplet code, so three bases code for each amino acid. It's also a non-overlapping code. So you don't read three bases, then shift on one, and read two of those bases again with an extra one. No, it goes three bases, then read the next three bases, then read the next three bases. So it's non-overlapping, each base only being read once. And it's also a degenerate code. Um, that's not an insult. Uh, that's just saying there's more than one codon for each amino acid, with the exception of tryptophan. Uh, let's have a look at that. So. Uh, we take uh, any three uh, nucleotides, let's take G, C, G. G, C, G, let's have a look at that. So first base, we say G, G, C, second base, and then G, ah, G, C, G, alanine. So if you find G, C, G on your mRNA, then that will code for alanine. Notice also GCA codes for alanine, as does GCC and GCU. That's what we mean by degenerate. So there are more than there's more than one code for this particular amino acid, alanine. There are 64 uh, codons in all, 4 to the power 3, and uh, that is because if there are 4 to the power 2, that wouldn't be enough to code for our 20 amino acids, uh, 4 to the power 2 being 16, and we need to code for 20 amino acids. Therefore, we've got to go 1 over, that gives us 64. There are also start and stop sequences. The ribosome needs instructions, not only as to which amino acids to put in order, but also when to start reading and when to stop reading. So our start sequence, AUG, that also codes for the amino acid methionine. Our stops are UAG, UAA, and UGA. On to translation. Now, these images you'll see here are 
older and clunkier images um, to stylize everything into shapes. I'll show you something more akin to the real thing later on and there's a very good YouTube animation or, or all of this that I will put, uh, well you'll see the reference on the screen but I'll also put a link to it uh, under the comments underneath this video. The ribosome comes along where is my cursor? Here is my cursor. I have the cursor. The ribosome comes along. Uh, it has two parts to it, the 60S subunit and the 40S subunit. And it's looking for our initiation codon, our AUG. And it will try to find that and bind on over that codon, AUG. Now, each tRNA, we've talked about mRNA so far. Uh, we haven't really talked about rRNA so far. rRNA is just a component part of the ribosome. R standing for ribosomal. Each tRNA, T standing for transfer RNA, um, carries a specific keyword amino acid. So this tRNA one uh, has this codon, or, sorry, has this anticodon on it, UAC. That is going to pair by complementary base pairing to this codon here, AUG. So we have hydrogen bonds forming between these complementary bases and therefore we can select very specifically which tRNA comes in. Now the tRNA which has the anticodon UAC will always have the same amino acid attached to it. In fact we know for this one it's methionine. This is more what a tRNA really looks like. As with all RNA, it is single-stranded, although you may look at this and say, well, that's not single-stranded. What on earth are you talking about, man? Well, it is single-stranded. It's just that that single strand is twisted up on itself in various regions. So, uh, cursor quest again. Here we go. So this is the single strand running along like this, but it so happens that this part of the single strand is complementary to this part of the single strand, and so they pair up. And that gives the tRNA its clover leaf shape, like that. This here is the anticodon, the anticodon, and that's going to determine which codon on mRNA it can bind to. It will bind to a complementary codon. And at this end of it, we have three unpaired bases, and these three unpaired bases will bind to this specific amino acid, the specific amino acid for this tRNA. So it is, the tRNA is merely an amino acid delivery system, a very, very specific amino acid delivery system. Moving on in translation. We had our first tRNA in place, and therefore we had our first amino acid in place. Next, we slot in, well, the ribosome moves along a codon, and our next tRNA slots in to the other binding site within the ribosome. That brings an amino acid with it, and these two amino acids are going to be linked by a peptide bond, that reaction is going to be catalyzed by an internal ribosome enzyme. It's also going to require ATP. It's going to need an energy source in order to do this. And so the process continues. The ribosome shifts along one codon at a time. An amino acid comes into that slot. A tRNA comes into that slot, bringing its amino acid with it, and so the chain grows, one amino acid at a time, until we reach a stop codon. And once it reaches a stop codon, well, you've guessed it, it comes to a stop. This uh, reference down here, doo -doo -doo here, this is a reference to another YouTube video. Do have a watch of it, it's about four minutes long or so, it's well worth the watch. It's well worth the effort. Now this is it in more accurately related form. <coughs> here is uh, here are the two tRNAs currently within the ribosome. They've got with them their 
anticodon, so this one has the anticodon UUU, and it is pairing up with the codon AAA. This particular tRNA has brought this amino acid with it, and this has already been joined on to the chain that has already been growing. Uh, notice at the top of the chain there's MET, that's methionine, that's our first amino acid. So all polypeptides initially begin with methionine, although it may then later be chopped off as the protein is modified, perhaps at the Golgi. Now, our next tRNA has already come in. It's, uh, it's allowed, been allowed to come in because its anticodon is AGC, which is going to be complementary to UCG there in codon 5 position. And here we've got our amine end, uh, and that will form a peptide bond with the carboxyl end of this amino acid here being catalyzed by an internal ribosome enzyme. This is happening inside the ribosome, not outside of it, as it appears to be here. And ATP is going to provide the energy for that, with the reaction being ATP plus H2O goes to ADP plus inorganic phosphate. Here is our next tRNA waiting to come in. It has the anticodon CAG, and that is complementary to this codon here, codon 6, GUC. And it's bringing with it this amino acid. Notice the R groups. This is R6, R5, R4, R3, R2, R1, we know as methionine, uh, refers to methionine. So that's a, maybe a, a, a less schematic representation of it, although of course everything is schematic when it comes down to it. One final thing on translation, the next video is going to cover other topics such as mutation, and control of protein synthesis. But one other thing on translation is that you don't just need to have one ribosome on an mRNA molecule. You might just have one ribosome, but you might have many ribosomes on that mRNA molecule. And this represents just that scenario. First quest, yeah, here we go. This ribosome here is the one that's been on it for the longest. And all ribosomes are moving in this direction from left to right. So this one's about to come to the stop codon and finish synthesizing its protein chain, its polypeptide chain. This one is the one which is bound on most recently, and it will move along this way. And of course, it will produce exactly the same protein as this one is produced. These are called polyribosomes for obvious reasons. There are many ribosomes on them, and sometimes that's shortened to the word polysome. Thank you.